Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, since we're running late, I'm gonna try to um, shorten a little bit the talk. Um, I'm gonna change the tune and get a little bit more into practical things. We surgeons like practical things, then I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about um, technical mastery and its pursuit. I have uh, the following disclosures, but there should be no conflicts with this presentation. Then what does it mean, master? A master is the highest level of achievement within a certain domain. That is how it's defined and it is documented in Dreyfus in uh, Science of Technical so Society. Then let me give you some introductory thoughts. It is innate to a surgeon to want to become a technical master. There is no question. It is also innate to a good surgeon to think it's a better surgeon than what he or she actually is. Uh, many times you're watching another colleague doing surgery and you think you can do it better. It's okay, that's normal. Just contain it, don't say it. <laughs> First step to accomplish mastery is to never believe you are a master. I have seen superb surgeons that feel that are better what they, than what they are, and it doesn't matter how superb they are. Through the years, I have seen them falling for a variety of reasons. Focus more on the pursuit of the technical mastery than if you're a master or not. And continuously listen and consider what others do. I'm very fortunate, I have a lot of observers that come all over the world to observe me. And what they don't know is that through the years, I have learned so much by allowing them to give me opinions during my own surgeries, and I'm grateful to them. Always consider ways to do it different and to do it better. That's something that is not innate to us. We are very pragmatic and we wanna do it the way how we were taught. But within a certain range of safety and always having the patient's well-being in mind, you should try to think a little different. And I'll show you a couple of pictures that illustrate that. I was told, I was told when I was training that the pancreas and the duodenum are inseparable, that you cannot do that on a live person. However, after certain years, I, I was able to do it, and if you can see here, this is the duodenum, this is the pancreas, and this is the common bile duct and pancreatic duct, that when you do it like this, you can extricate it a little bit more. Then we, sometimes you don't even stop there, and you try to see this is a patient that has uh, pancreas divisum, and as you know, pancreas divisum is the failure to, to blend the posterior bud with the anterior bud, and we have a crevice here where the common bile duct and the, the, what it was supposed to be the main pancreatic duct, the bursum is here, but the sartorini duct is the main pancreatic duct on this patient. Then again, duodenum, this is the pancreas. Then these things are not only um, good for the patient, but are also very cool to show. Um, what we learn from that is that we could pull the common bile duct out of the pancreas. Then on patients with a colidocal cyst that was intrapancreatic, rather than cutting the cyst there, or if there was some dysplasia on the biopsies doing a whipple, we decided to try to extricate the common bile duct out of the pancreas. And this is what you can see here. This is a whole common bile duct up to here. And if you go over here, this is the duodenum. This is where we took out the whole pancreatic duct. And this is almost as it's entering here. There are other obvious, the obvious technical tips that I would have to discuss, but this is not the point here. Then how do you get there? Surgical training, obviously, and I'm not gonna expand on that. You need to know your limitations in that way you don't hurt patients. Then when you're gonna do something new, always think, would I do it on a relative of mine? But think on a relative that you like, just in case. <laughs> the 10,000 hours, there's a group, uh, there's a book that is uh, from, from good to great. It is a great book, and it talks about the 10,000 hours. You need to practice, practice, and practice, and think about it. There are no shortcuts to become master. In terms of MIS, I would strongly recommend recalled, record all your surgeries. It's very easy. You just flip a button, and you can record them. And then do video-based education. 
Our next lecture is going to be about video-based assessment, and I'm not going to talk about that because we have an expert talking about that. But in terms of video-based education, it is not new. This is Dr. Doyan in 1859 showing how to do a thyroidectomy. Obviously, you cannot learn much about this. You're just sh showing it, it, and you'll see the anesthesiologist giving a little bit of ether. This is a real, um, that, a real surgery, and that's a big, big goiter. And you'll see how he's going to deflate the goiter. Look how the patient is breathing. Now the anesthesiologist gives a little bit more ether, and the patient is bleeding a little faster. The, the assistant, there he goes, it decompresses, et cetera, et cetera. But video-based education didn't start recently for those that think that it's new or they're being cool. Learning by seeing. I do believe that if you edit videos of experienced surgeons, it's, you're going to learn a lot. Because if you edit them, you need to tell the story. You need to understand the steps of the surgery. And you are forced to know what do you include on the video or not. Then that's the first thing to do. Again, a lot of the trainees that I am fortunate to have edited my, vid edited my videos. And then some of them, when they get to train with me after having edited several videos, for example, of distal pancreatectomy, a particular technique we do, they come and they tell me, I feel like I have already done this procedure. Yeah, because you have edited, edited six or seven videos. Review and edit your own operations. It's amazing how surprised you will be of what you see. Because when you're doing the surgery, you are focused on doing it. You don't see what's happening around it. When you are now re back looking at your operation, especially those operations that you feel you're not doing very well, or you don't understand why one operation worked and the other one didn't, then you will be able to see what's happening. You will be able to learn of your mistakes. You will be able to learn from what it worked and select the most efficient way. I remember this distinctively because at the time that I started to do laparoscopic adrenalectomies, no one was talking about it. There were no lectures. There was nowhere to, where to, to, to learn other than talking to other people. Then I couldn't understand why some of my adrenalectomies work. And I put six in a row, and I understood exactly that I was in the wrong plane just by observing my own videos. Then I would strongly recommend to do that, even if you are a good advanced surgeon, if there's an operation that something is not clicking, something is not right, compare what you're doing in one that you felt it went good and the other one that didn't. That tells you, too, that helps you for mental preparedness for the next case. And let me talk a little bit about mental preparedness and men men mental readiness. Um, human excellence in all domains is guided by mental factors. And experience of exceptional performers suggests that there are seven critical elements of excellence. And this is called the will of excellence. The Wheel of Excellence by Terry Orlex, it has several components, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss them, but I just want to concentrate on two of them, on positive images and mental readiness. And why do I say this? Because I learned this from my son. My son played, rug played rugby for, for the U.S. national team. He was a college All-American, and then in the, in the actual U.S. national team, he also played for Oxford. Now I'm showing off. <laughs> and uh, before the, t the games, I used to go and watch him, of course. I was, you know, I was absolutely happy with that and proud. And I realized that they gave him two hours before the start of the game, without practice, without anything. And I asked him, why do they do that? He says, because they want us to get into the zone. And I said, oh, interesting. How do you get into the zone? He told me that he used to see the videos and of all the people before those two hours, and then close his eyes while listening to music and see the images of all what was, he thought was going to happen in the game. He remembered the people that may hit him in the face. He remembered how to tackle the things. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And uh, let me look if there's something into this in surgery. And indeed, there is. This is a study that's not new. It's from 2005. But there was a psychologist that analyzed 33 expert surgeons in six different fields. And he went to, this, to chiefs of surgeries at break, uh, big academic centers and asked them, who is your best technical surgeon? And then he chose these 33. 
And he, the common factor in all of them is that rehearse the procedure ahead of time. And if you think yourself, and this is what happened to me when I read this, if you're going to do a difficult case, not your routine case, many times when you're driving to the hospital, you start thinking, how are you going to do it? That's mental imagery. Facilitates and the, the, the movement. It makes it more fluid. It anticipates potential hazards. If I know there's going to be a replaced right hepatic artery on the pancreatic procedure that I'm going to do on the Whipple procedure, I start thinking, where is it going to originate? Where is it going to go? I visualize it. And it transforms two-dimensional drawings, rotate. You can do this in a variety of things. That's a little bit more. This is by Orlick and Donald. But mental imagery rehearsal really is very, very useful. And I do feel that adds and may not differ more from actual physical practice during the learning process. All of this is documented in several good studies. There was one study that was a prospective randomized that compared residents on basic laparoscopy in three groups, ones that they did additional mental training, meaning they made them close their eye and imagine the surgery beforehand, and 32 that did an extra practical training and then the 35 control, and they concluded basically that the 31 with additional mental training did much better than any of the other two groups. Because of this, to several of my fellows, while I'll scrub, because if I say these things, you know, close your eyes, and I think this guy is crazy. But while they were scrubbing, I would say, how are you going to do the procedure? And they would tell me, okay, I'm going to go, let's say, a gallbladder. I'm going to go and take the gallbladder. I'm going to clip the cystic. I said, how are you going to clip the cystic? Like, with clips. Where do you mean clips? Well, I'm going to put a large clip. And where are you going to put it? All through the trocar. You haven't even put the trocar yet. And where are you going to put the trocar? then I force them to go mentally in their mind, step by step, to do the procedure what we were describing. And this was very useful. Now, is technical expertise enough to be a master surgeon? For many of us, we believe it is, and for others are not. Carlos Pellegrini, who I significantly respect, and several of you probably do too, said that there are 10 elements to achieve mastery. The ability to not only technical, these are 10 different elements, the ability to develop and lead a high performance team, a clear focus on patient-centered care, the ability to train, teach, and learn, championing quality of care, embracing professionalism, then the, the ability to develop and lead a performance, hold on a second, something happened here. Number six, humbleness, excellent communication skills, developing high degree of emotional intelligence, engendering trust, and self-protection and balance. Obviously, we don't have enough time to expand in all of this, but this is just to introduce the concept that to be really an overall master surgeon, you need to consider other things. Um, because of the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, this um, these videos that show um, difficult cases. And I'm just gonna go to take away thoughts. Really, if you wanna be a master surgeon, don't think if you are a master surgeon or not. Concentrate, as I said, on the pursuit of mastery. Practice makes perfect. Always think on ways to do it better, differently. There are some procedures like a distal pancreatectomy that I feel my, the technique that I have adopted is fantastic, it clicks perfect, but I always think, can I do something better? Be humble. The better you are, the easier it becomes to be humble. The true master surgeon has achieved a level of inner strength and security that leads him her to be humble. Thank you very much.